Hello all and welcome to, 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 to today's seminar hosted by the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics. My name is Shalini Grover and I'm an anthropologist and an assistant professorial research fellow at the IAI. I'm incredibly pleased to be chairing today's seminar titled Viable Lives, Life Beyond Survival in Rural North India, a lovely title, uh, which is part of the IAI Inequality Seminar Series. Today's speakers are a very accomplished couple, Associate Professor Jane Dyson and Professor Craig Jeffrey. Uh, and Jane Dyson is an Associate Professor of Human Geography at the University of Melbourne and is a well-known ethnographer. Indeed, her ethnographic work has been illuminating, and I know a few geographers who've carried out such consistent and long-term research in the Himalayas region on such nuanced topics such as gender and friendship in India, childhoods, employment and education. Jane is the author of Working Childhoods, Youth Agency and the Environment in India, published in 2014 by Cambridge University Press. She's also producer and director of two ethnographic documentary films titled Lifelines and Spirits and the, recep uh, the receiver of three major grants. So Jane, a very warm welcome to you here uh, at the III. Uh, Craig Jeffrey needs no introduction at all. He's Professor of Human Geography at the University of Melbourne. He was given a personal chair at the University of Oxford and has served as director of the Australia in Institute uh, between 2015 and 2020. Uh, Craig is very prolific. He's authored seven books, uh, the most famous one being Time Pass, Youth, Class and the Politics of Waiting in India, published in 2010 by Stanford University Press. And this book is one of the two most cited anthropological monographs on India over the last 10 years, and truly a very important study, one that I also uh, am constantly quoting. So Craig, uh, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, may I also thank uh, Alpa who um, organized this event and uh, Emma and Peter for their, uh, uh, their wonderful contributions as usual. Uh, may I ask our online audience to keep yourselves muted. As usual, there'll be a chance for you to pose questions later, and we we'll take questions uh, both in person and online. So now I hand you over to Craig and Jane and really, really look forward uh, to your talk, both of you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Shalini, for that very lovely introduction i hope you can hear me both online and in the room if there's any problem maybe if somebody could shout out that would be very helpful uh thank you so much for inviting us to speak and i'm particularly grateful to professor alpha shah uh, <laughs> for encouraging us to speak i know that alpha's joining online and to peter and the team for all their organizational help we're very sorry we can't be there in London, which would be much nicer. Uh, but um, actually, I, I, I'm in Delhi at the moment, and Jane is in Melbourne. So um, we're, we're being across to you from different parts of the world. Um, this is a, a joint paper it's authored by, by Jane and myself. It's new work. It, this paper has not been published. It's not a rehash or, or recapitulation of, of something we've, we've already got in, in print. Uh, but in some ways, it relates quite closely to an article that we wrote that appeared in Progress in Human Geography recently called Vi about viability, called Viable Geographies. And it's in some ways a kind of substantive accompaniment to that uh, more conceptual piece. I will really get the feedback on, on the paper and really delighted to have this opportunity to present uh, today. So, um, uh, and, and I should say that I'm, I'm going to present the paper. Um, and then Jane and I will, will uh, together answer questions. So that, that's, that's how we'll work it. So social, economic and environmental crises have compelled many marginalized people to reflect on survival and viability in different places across the world. 
Many minoritized and marginalized populations are debating what constitutes a survivable life and in turn how life can be arranged so that it is more than just survival. In this process, they're often analyzing how to conceptualize life. Notwithstanding these trends, scholarly accounts in the social sciences have been heavily skewed towards analysis of how institutions at the top, notably the state, imagine and produce life and viability. This paper contributes to redressing the balance by examining the spatial and temporal process through which young people envisage and build viable lives in an area of the Indian Himalayas. We highlight the importance for these young people of building jivan, a Hindi word for life, and an idea particularly associated with survival. We also emphasize the significance people attach to being able to live beyond survival, ethically and affectively. We will argue that this sense of ethical and affective purpose is linked to their efforts to protect their social, environmental and spiritual milieu, which they frequently term puri life or whole life. We develop our argument in part through engaging critically with the work of philosopher Giorgio Agamben. Agamben examines how states have exercised sovereign power over the past 2000 years through confining sections of the population to what he terms bare life, a condition in which they're unable to participate in the ordinary political life of citizens. Agamben refers to camps, detention centers, and impoverished world regions as sites in which a state of exception exists. Cast out of mainstream society, people are forced to live in a state of bare life. Agamben's work has been enormously influential. But as many geographers have argued, his discussion of political power exaggerates government dominance at the expense of analyzing human agency and is also ahistorical, failing to engage with the diversity of ways in which power and social practice play out in specific places. A connected but relatively ignored weakness of Agamben's work is that he does not examine how people on the ground may conceptualize the situation of being forced to live in situations seemingly similar to bare life, nor how people theorize life and viability. The work of the anthropologist Gassen Hajj helps to address these problems with Agamben's work. Building on Agamben, Hajj argues that many governments are concerned to make life just bearable for people they regard as unworthy of living full human lives. Hajj terms this minimal viability. But Hajj also notes that marginalized people are often able to find ways to live beyond survival, such that they achieve what he terms viability proper. Viability proper, or proper viability, incorporates enjoyment, sociality, environmental engagement, and ethical issues. Judith Butler similarly explores this idea in her account of livability. Butler uses this term to refer to how people's capacity to live beyond mere survival commonly depends upon a set of ethical dispositions. Broadly, these dispositions include a tendency to value the lives of others, nurture social relationships, and maintain the environmental frameworks that sustain life. Recent geographical and anthropological work offers a basis for developing Hodge and Butler's ideas about populations building proper viability or livability, and doing so with respect to ideas of life. For example, Benjamin Fash and co-workers have described how social, economic and environmental crises have compelled many members of indigenous populations in Latin America to focus on issues of survival. They concentrate on core dimensions of life, food, shelter and work, for example. But crises have also propelled them to think afresh about what it means to survive well. This effort to build what Hajj would term proper viability entails reflection on ethically important ideas about how society should be democratically organized, social relationships, environmental care, and spiritual and cultural health. In the remainder of the paper, we develop this idea of proper, proper viability through reference to field research in rural North India. We will show how young people in Bemni village are engaged in social action that simultaneously focuses on survival and involves youth in reflecting on what it means to live beyond survival. Reflection that's 
oriented around the discussion of their engagement with Puri life, their wider social, environmental, and spiritual cultural milieu. Peter, I would really appreciate it if, if at this point you could share your screen and show um, the slides. So a short intermission for some uh, pictures, mainly of the, of the village. So Bemley Village is located at 2,700 meters in altitude, and it's shown here in the title slide in rural Chamoli district in the Indian state of Uttarakhand. So Peter, if you could advance to the next slide of the map to show those of you unfamiliar with uh, India, Indian geography, Uttarakhand there is shown in dark pink, uh, a mainly mountainous state. In 2012, the village had a population of approximately 1,000. If you could switch to the next slide, Peter. This is a picture of, of Bemni with Trishul Mountain in the distance, uh, taken from, uh, as Shalini kindly mentioned, Jane's films, one of the films that, that Jane made. Um, I think, Jane, this is from Lifelines, isn't it? Or, or it's either from Lifelines or from Spirit, uh, but showing the village there at the bottom, in the bottom right of the screen. You could move to the next slide, Peter. Uh, the, the economy of Bemni remains primarily agricultural. Households cultivate crops largely for subsistence while managing the surrounding forest for pastoral use. Women are mainly responsible for agricultural work, none of which is mechanized. 75% of villagers were uh, uh, Rajputs in the village and 25% uh, are Dalits. In, ge in general, Rajputs own more land than Dalits and partly as a result are often slightly wealthier but all Dalit households own some land in Bemni and they're not employed in the fields of higher castes on a regular basis. Caste inequalities in the village are much less pronounced than in Plains, India. You could move to the next slide, please, Peter. Uh, gender inequalities persist in the village. Women lack control over household finances and are expected to conduct the vast majority of farming work. Education has led some young women to challenge aspects of patriarchy, however, as we've argued in a recent paper in the Journal of Royal Anthropological Institute uh, called Reformist Agency. Uh, to get to this, the point of this slide, between 2003 and the present, the government initiated a range of infrastructural initiatives that had a major impact on the village. Between 2008 and 2012, the government installed electricity, built a road connecting Bemni to a nearby town, and created several schools and community buildings. This has enabled children to study up to secondary school in Bemni. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows one of the, the village's schools. Farming remains the major livelihood strategy, but is becoming increasingly difficult as climate change has led to unpredictable and extreme weather, excessive monsoon rainfall, increasingly dry winters, and hailstorms that damage crops. Young men and an increasing proportion of young women have sought off farm employment in this context. However, they've typically failed to find secure public sector work, reflecting a shortage of government jobs ready to demand. In addition, the low incomes of most villagers, combined with geographical remoteness and poor infrastructure, has often limited possibilities to start local businesses. Many young men and a small number of educated young women responded to these pressures through migrating to urban areas for work. However, a lack of social contacts, high rents, and the absence of secure well-paid employment made it very difficult for young people from all caste groups to develop livelihoods in cities. Jane conducted 15 months of field work in Bemni in 2003 to 2004, focusing primarily on children's work and schooling, but also encompassing research with 18 to 45 year olds, research that resulted in the book with Cambridge University Press published in 2014, Working Childhoods. Between 2011 and 2022, Jane returned 11 times and I returned four times, together completing a combined 16 months of field work. As part of this field work, we conducted participant observation and open-ended interviews with 35 young men, 30 Rajput and five Dalit, and 30 young women, 25 Rajput and five Dalit, all of whom had been educated to at least class 10 at the senior, at least high school level. <clears throat> 
A remarkable feature of our conversations with young people about their social action in Bemni was the extent to which they reflected on the importance of survival, using the English word or the phrase being able to carry on, chalsakna. The example of a Rajput young man named Mavir Singh, who came from a relatively poor household in the village, is indicative. Mavir had been educated up to class 12 in the early 2000s, but his schooling had been patchy. The teachers were negligent, he often missed classes to help with farm work. His family were unable to pay for college, and so after school, Mavir immediately sought paid work. He joined a cousin in Mumbai, where he worked as a security guard in a shopping mall. But the, off the job offered little pay, uh, no security, and few opportunities for advancement, and it was difficult to spend it. When Mavia's mother fell ill in 2011, he returned to the village. Some months later, we met him ushering his mules up the new dirt road that led to the village. Mavia plunged straight into talking about life, Jeevan, and, and the challenges of forging a livelihood in Bemni. I've just got back, and so I have to find a way to survive. Survive, Kanna Parthahe, he said. It's about finding a, a path when others are blocked. I'll farm, but I'll have to make other work too. And we were meeting Mavir. Jane had worked with Mavir in 2003, 2004, I should emphasize. So we were meeting him for the first time for a while, but uh, we had that history with him. In the village, Mavir worked on the government's Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. He worked in house construction. He'd also used his savings to buy two mules with which he, uh, he earned an income hauling building materials in Bemni taking on occasional portering jobs for trekkers or moving for three months a year to work as a porter at pilgrimage sites in Uttarakhand. I built a life, he said, using the word jivan. This combination of earning opportunities was constantly in flux. In 2013, while portering at the pilgrimage site of Kedanat, Mavia was trapped in the mountains for a month by the devastating floods that killed thousands. Deeply traumatized, he vowed never to return and concentrated on work in the village. Two years later, excessively heavy rain caused landslides that destroyed some of his fields. So he took up construction work outside the village to compensate for the loss. This changed again when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March 2020 and India was plunged into lockdown. During the two years that he did not leave the village, Mavia turned to local building projects and experimented with new cash crops. Finally, the pilgrimage sites reopened in May 2022, and in their desperation for an income, Mavia and other young men overcame their fear and returned to Kedanat for portering work. As he reflected on these shifts, Mavia emphasized that he'd had to focus on basic life. Mavia's experiences resonate with those of many other young men in Bemni. Most had some experience of migrating out of Bemni. And in the majority of cases, this experience of urban migration had been unsuccessful, even among households wealthier than Mavia's. Young women were much less likely to migrate to cities or conduct other paid work within or outside the village. But young women had similarly dispiriting experiences of acquiring poor quality education, applying fruitlessly for salaried jobs, and balancing different forms of work. In young women's case, typically farm work, household work, and caring responsibilities. Mavia's example is also indicative of young people's social work. Mavia argued that his own life would not be viable unless he also assisted the village. He said that climate change was making farming increasingly difficult. Medical facilities were practically absent. Schools lacked resources, and there were scarce employment opportunities. Young people feared that these problems would encourage an increasing number of young adults to leave the village and therefore engaged in social action. For example, Mavia and other young people often led initiatives to address infrastructural problems. In the frequent periods when the village water pressure or, or supply was low due to faulty pipes or landslides higher up the mountain, Mavia and others would spend hours or even days working to solve the issue. Much of this work was also social. He advised other young people about employment opportunities and invested effort in improving education. And we've described some of this social work in, in other papers. Dalit young men regularly worked alongside Rajput young men, particularly in infrastructural problems, sorry, infrastructural projects. Young women in Bemni carried out a range of activities similar to that described 
for, uh, for Mavir, assisting with village level infrastructural issues and providing educational and health advice in particular. A running theme of young people's action was its role in connecting different spaces and domains together, which they felt was crucial for survival. Patrols of the water pipes, reconnecting fault, faulty electricity lines and campaigning for schools al alongside efforts to protect or develop other lifelines all serve as vehicles for shoring up the village as a social and material place. But young people also argued that they were not simply engaged in ensuring minimal viability or living a narrow, bearable or bare life. They said they were also concerned with how to live an ethical life, maximize opportunities for positive affect, such as joy, and acknowledge and support aspects of cultural practice. So young people sometimes make a distinction in this context between surviving and surviving well or between jivan and leading a good life, achijiv. This point about young people's reflection on life beyond survival is connected to the observation that young people frequently made that while jivan was often their focus, they were also centrally interested in nurturing puri life, understood as the social, environmental, and cultural spiritual milieu in which they lived, a milieu much broader than the village and roughly associated with the administrative block as well as, to some extent, the wider Chamoli district. The dual process of addressing Jeevan and Puri life and the opportunities this provided for affective, ethical and cultural expression emerged regularly in Bemli. One such example occurred in March 2017, when Mavia led an expedition to rescue an injured villager. It was already late afternoon when Mavia jogged quickly past our courtyard. What's the rush, we asked. Without stopping, he called back up. There's been an emergency and we need to make a plan. Come if you like. In the village, we joined a gathering of mostly young men. Rather vague news had reached them that a goat herder had been badly bitten by a dog and was stranded in a high altitude meadow. Mavia directed the deliberations with no road access to such a remote region and no trained medical team in the village. The man would need to be carried back to Bemni before finding transport to a clinic in a nearby town. 12 young men of different economic and caste backgrounds immediately volunteered to assist with the rescue. The light was already fading when Mavia led the group, including me, out of the village. With playful competitiveness, several men joked about who was the fittest as they strode up the steep rocky path. Others sang Garwali songs, praising the beauty of the landscape. Mavia pointed out a spot where he'd previously encountered a ghost and others talked of their fear of these remote areas. They stopped regularly at small shrines where they offered gifts to the gods and uttered short prayers seeking protection. At 11 p.m. after five hours of relentless climbing, the now silent group finally reached the injured man and his friend, both huddled by a fire. Neither man was from Bemni after all, but Mavia quickly assessed the injury and applied clean bandages. He then laid out the options for the rescue and after lengthy discussions, decided that the man was well enough to wait overnight and ride a mule down to Bemni in the morning from where, he'd be take, from where he would be taken by jeep to the local hospital. Mavia promised the men he would arrange the mule with some herders that they'd met on the way up and who were staying in some summer huts. Having settled on the plan, one man took out a pile of over 50 chapatis wrapped in newspaper while another revealed an enormous slab of packaged biscuits. The herders offered around goat meat that they'd been toasting over the fire. The laughter returned as the young man began telling stories once more. Sometime after midnight, Mavia stood up, signaling the end of the impromptu party. He promised the injured man that another rescue party would arrive with a mule in the morning and called everyone to gather their bags. Revived by the food, the men began skipping downhill. At a large scree slope, they raced each other jumping onto each other's backs for piggyback rides. Finally, long past 3 a.m., the group turned the last zigzag into Bemni, called hushed greetings to each other and returned exhausted to their respective homes. In reflecting on the rescue attempt the next day, Mavia said that the mission was partly about ensuring that life, Jeevan, was possible in Bemni through the provision of key services. But he said that the incident also highlighted opportunities to strengthen social, environmental, and spiritual dynamics 
that are affectively, culturally, and ethically important and exceed basic life. Marvi explained that they were part of a network of villages in the region for whom reciprocal collective social action was a given. During the rescue, Marvio and the other young men had also referred to the event as an opportunity to affirm their connection to the natural and spiritual environment, which they regarded as crucial to leading a good life. There was, the rescue is indicative of many other instances in which young men intervened to help others to acquire health care. But the rescue was also an occasion where young men could collectively reaffirm their commitment to Purdy life, the social, environmental, and spiritual milieu in which they live and express ethical, cultural, and affective priorities. The management of the health of a woman named Roshni Devi illustrates further how engagement with Puri life offered opportunities to build ethical values, cultural meaning, and positive affect, albeit in some contradictory ways. Roshni arrived in Bemni in 2004 as a newly married daughter-in-law to a family with whom Jane was close. A strong worker, she quickly slipped into the role as the household's primary farmer. In many senses, the household's future rested on Roshni's capacity both to farm effectively and produce the next generation. But several years passed and Roshni was unable to conceive. Roshni's husband, who had spent only the first year of their marriage in the village, had returned to a restaurant job in Delhi and visited only rarely. When he did, he would accompany Roshni to nearby towns to seek medical tests for their infer infertility. In 2009, he finally consulted a religious leader who concluded that Roshni had been possessed by a spirit. It emerged that a couple of years before her wedding, Roshni had been collecting firewood in the forest on the high ridge that separated the land between her natal village and Bemni. She remembered playfully imitating being possessed by a ghost dancing and throwing her hair around. It had just seemed like harmless fun, but now it was understood that her disrespect had angered a spirit and that she was being punished through her infertility. She realized that her action had not been respectful of Puri life, as a villager put it. The pundit, the religious leader, recommended they invest in an exorcism ceremony. He identified a location where the ceremony should occur high above the village on the edge of the forest, chosen to represent where Roshni had become possessed. In preparation, Roshni's husband went directly to seek Marvia's help in gathering a group of young men to assist with the ceremony. They had all participated in several such exorcisms and were essential for its success. On the chosen day, Marvia and other young men accompanied Roshni, her husband, the pundit, and Jane up to the spot. The young men set to work arranging a temporary temple in front of a small rock where they laid down some women's personal items, a headscarf, comb, and bindis, while others collected firewood. Peter, would you be kind enough to advance the slides? Sorry, there was one other moment where I wanted that to happen. The young men set to work arranging a temporary temple in front of a small rock where they lay down some women's personal items. Sorry, I've, I've said that already, but a headscarf, a headscarf, comb and bindis. Using a mix of flour and water, Marvia crafted an effigy of the spirit's face. Peter, could you show the next slide, please? The pundit had prepared the temple ground with patterns made with powdered dye pots of turmeric, water and milk, into which he dipped sprigs of leaves. A goat, brought at great expense for the occasion, was blessed before being sacrificed, and the blood from its decapitated head dripped over the effigy. Meanwhile, Marvio and the other young men cleaned the goat and roasted it in the fire, carefully disposing of the stomach contents so as not to pollute the scene. Over the next couple of hours, they ate heartily and with great joy, before packing the remaining meat to share in the village, and tidying the area. Marvia explained that while the puja and their own labor was primarily for Roshni, they also took it as an opportunity to acknowledge the gods' protection of their collective well-being, which they should never take for granted. Two years after the exorcism in 2011, and still unable to conceive, Roshni accompanied her husband to Delhi, where she underwent scans and surgery to treat her infertility. They decided she would stay for longer term treatment and she found paid work looking after an elderly couple. 
They visited Bemni twice a year and continued to consult villagers and the pundit about their predicament. Finally, in 2014, 10 years into a childless marriage, they'd saved enough to invest in a more elaborate ceremony to seek the advice of a deity in Bemni. Jane was in the village once more when Roshni and her husband arrived for their dancing puja. St starting in the late afternoon, crowds of villagers gathered in the family courtyard as two delicate musicians called on the deity with leather and tin drums, accompanied by village dancers clothed in ceremonial dresses. Uh, Peter, could you show the next slide, please? Thank you. Eventually, the deity took over the bodies of both Roshni and an oracle, and for several hours danced wildly and expanded their wrath. Once again, the ceremony had relied heavily on young men to support it. Mavir and several friends spent hours preparing the courtyard, erecting awnings, wiring additional lighting, building a huge fire, boiling vast kettles of tea, and taking turns to blow horns to call villages and the deities. Even more than the relatively small scale of the ghost exorcism, this ceremony relied heavily also on the collective participation of many other villagers, including younger and older people, men and women of all castes, and including, uh, I should say, especially young women. The deity needed to be coaxed into the oracle with men's dances and women's chants, and the eventual possession need, needed to be witnessed, acknowledged and revered. Nine months after the puja, in early 2015, a baby boy was born, followed two years later by another boy. The following year in 2018, Jane was present again when Roshni and her husband returned for another ceremony, this time to thank the deity. It was a slightly smaller affair than the previous one, conducted inside a packed room. The atmosphere was relaxed, happy, but still reverent, as the deity revealed themselves in the bodies of Roshni and the oracle. Again, Mavir and his friends supported the puja and reflected on it as an opportunity to celebrate efforts to improve Roshni's health and express their gratitude to the gods for their collective well-being. Roshni's struggle to conceive offers another example of the importance for young men and other villagers of attending simultaneously to Jivan and Puri life, in this case in an effort that spanned 14 years. Young men and also young women provided assistance that required extensive skills and knowledge. For example, they ensured that villagers complied with a complex set of rituals, discussed how to make the most terrifying ghost effigy, and created an atmosphere conducive for the puja. In doing this, they drew on and cross-referenced prior experiences with pujas in the village, including those connected to the life cycle of birth, marriage and death, ghost exorcisms for the mentally or physically affected, and larger village-wide events connected to the seasons or in response to an outbreak of foot and mouth disease and other crises. In such ways, in this and other examples, young people reaffirm their commitment to working intensively to assist villagers with core issues connected to human living. At the same time, they express their commitment to repairing, sustaining, and celebrating a wider ethically valued social, environmental, and spiritual cultural milieu, puri life. The exorcism reproduced gendered concepts around women's responsibilities relating to work and their bodies and their subordination to men. Such practices also reinforced caste roles in Bemni. At the same time, however, spirit possession offers women a means of positioning themselves as central to the production of ethical value in Bemni express suffering and sometimes influence social outcomes. Young people often connected Puri life with a mountainous area incorporating their valley and villages in contiguous valleys. This understanding reflect their, reflected their strong social and environmental connections, including the network of kin scattered throughout the region, the, the reciprocal relationships that were based on previous and current trade, the depth of environmental knowledge of the surrounding area, and the spiritual and cultural connection to the land and non-human beings that cohabit it. But Puri life was not a sphere that existed outside and above people's daily village-based practice. It was found in things as micro as patching up a broken path, stopping to place flowers in a shrine, or painting a face of an effigy of a ghost. 
To conclude, climate change, a lack of jobs and poor welfare services radically altering how lives could be led in Bemni, sometimes seemingly necessitating a focus on survival and simply bearable life. Young people focused on the pursuit of Jeevan, understood as meeting core needs related to food, housing, infrastructure, education, health, work, and physical security. This entailed concentrating on viability in the minimal sense, minimal viability in Gas and Hajj's terms. At the same time, however, young people argued their lives afforded opportunities to pursue ethical projects and build cultural meaning and positive affect. These ethical and cultural affective opportunities emerged especially through their collective work to nurture the wider social, environmental and spiritual cultural milieu, which they often labelled Kuli life. We've emphasised the somewhat complex spatialities and temporalities of young people's practice. The pursuit of Jeevan and efforts to link Jeevan to Kuli life entailed making connections between different spaces within the village and connecting Bemni to a wider space economy and connecting different life domains, such as education, work, and health. The temporalities of building viabilities were similarly complex. Young people emphasized the need to engage with short-term projects that resolved issues connected to Jeevan, for example, through fixing broken water pipes. They also need, talked about the need to reflect on longer-term transformations in opportunities in the region, for example, those related to external events such as COVID-19. Young people argued that the survival required awareness of the cyclical nature of Puri life and possibility of renovating past practices connected to this cycle, or these cycles plural. In the Bemni context then, proper viability emerges as a spatially and temporally com complex process of extracting value out of the inseparability of human life, jivan, and the wider life, Puri life, in which people are enmeshed. So thank you for your patience for listening to this presentation and we'd be delighted to take questions. Uh, totally fascinating, uh, uh, Craig and Jane, that was just, just wonderful. The, uh, the everyday of survival, uh, the gendering of survival, ethical self-making, identity, uh, all these things have been so beautifully put by you. So uh, we'll take questions uh, and we'll take the, uh, we'll alternate. We'll do one from the room and then one online. So the online people, please uh, use the raise hand function. So the first question is uh, from our audience in the room. Anybody? Um, yeah, yeah, please uh, introduce yourself. I'm James Foster. Um, yeah. I've been involved in a little project uh, called the uh, Bhutan Gross National Happiness Index. And the various dimensions are being reflected in some of the things discussed today. I was curious whether the authors have contrasted uh, the locality here to the state-led effort to understand well-being and flourishing, not happiness, but flourishing, that's what the translation would be, in Bhutan. So any comments on that? Craig, Jane, please go ahead. Jane, do you want me to, to answer that? Well, I, I'll just go ahead because I can't hear Jane at the moment. And, and the, the answer is no, we haven't, Foster. So it sounds like we could have some very productive conversations with you. We'll be really interested to hear about your work. Uh, so um, let, let's exchange contact details because the sound, that sounds like a very interesting um, connection. Sure enough. Thank you. Online, um, anyone online for a question? Sorry, I can't see from here. Is it uh, Alpa? Do you have a question? I, hey, thanks, Shalini. Uh, thanks, uh, Craig and Jane. It's really fascinating to hear your work presented in these terms. And I guess um, I'm a little confused um, and I would love a little bit of help. I mean, uh, I mean, the things you've described is what like anthropologists talk about all the time, right? Like how people who 
philosophers like um, Agamben might construct as being reduced to bare life, but you know we're showing about we're showing how full and how whole, wholesome life can be, uh, and is constructed out of you know people's holistic relationships with the environment, the spirits, each other, marriages, kinship, rituals. I mean, this is the stuff of like daily life that holistic is considered by anthropologists in any situation so um I'm wondering I'm, I'm wondering where you're going with this like what does this add um beyond a critique of Agamben's bare life how does it help us think about um yeah I guess ways in which inequalities has been theorized. I'm thinking about, you know, um, Amrata Sen's capabilities approach, for example. I mean, where, where are you going with this? I, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand beyond, uh, beyond the kind of critique of bare life. Uh, so that's my kind of my first question. Um, and then the second, I guess, is more uh, in terms of the local concepts you're using. And uh, Jeevan is often considered to be um, uh, you know, live livelihood. Uh, and there's Jeevan, and you talk about Puri Jeevan. Um, and then I wanted to ask you about Zindagi, uh, which is life uh you know and and the ability to live life um uh um so i wanted to i wanted to ask you about zindagi where is zindagi uh in 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 all of this um yeah i guess that's my um my second question and then i understand that you're working in a context where things like caste inequalities aren't as um aren't as um uh as as differentiated or as uh, um, is easily observed as they are in the plains, but how does gender inequalities, caste inequalities, if you were to take these ideas like beyond um, the local context that you're working in, like how do they, how do we conceptualize, you know, how do we bring forward these intersectional inequalities into uh, the ideas of uh, yeah, th thinking thinking Jeevan and Puri Jeevan uh, conceptually uh, and 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 doing doing you know doing add, adding to uh, adding to your critique of bare life. How do we also you know um, think about these intersectional inequalities and what they would do to your concepts? Um, so yes, uh, three I guess different uh, different questions kind of related. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alpo. I think I'll maybe have a, I'll have a go at this, and Jane can pick up a, a, on on elements that I miss out. I think our observation to go to the sort of first sentence of the presentation is that the current socio-economic and environmental crises affecting marginalised populations in different parts of the world is bringing into very sharp focus a, a concern with survival, with basic survival, and and also. And, and sort of in seemingly paradoxically at first blush, those social, economic and environmental crises are also leading people to reflect on, on what it is to live beyond survival. So what affective, spiritual, cultural, um, seemingly more esoteric aspects of life are important in defining what, what proper viability, what a proper full good life looks like. Uh, um, we're drawing in, in part there, I think, on some of the, um, the writing on indigenous populations in different parts of the world. Some of the work on youth is influence, is, has influenced us very strongly. Some of the work, recent work on childhood. And I think you're absolutely right. This is, this is what anthropologists have been writing about all the time. And that's partly Gus and Haji's point in introducing sort of the idea of viability that you, know, you could actually read a lot of anthropological work as an attempt to understand how people try to, to live viable lives. But our point is that the current global conjuncture is bringing these aspects of viability, minimal viability and proper viability into very sharp focus. And it's reflected, I think, in quite a lot of ethnographic work that's happening in different parts of the world 
particularly with minoritized and marginalized populations. Associated with that too, I think, is a growing self-consciousness about what minimal viability and proper viability or, or the good life looks like. And, and so you know, actually notions of, of sort of equivalent to life and survival and, and viability are emerging sort of very strongly in the ethnographic record uh, as sort of ethno-sociological concepts. Um, so you see that in, in the Latin American literature quite a lot, but also in a lot of indigenous literature with, with different versions of notions of um, the good life. We're also picking up here, uh, and again, connected to, to um, the work of, of many anthropologists in the UK on, on work on the anthropology of ethics that has made the point that a lot of social science has focused too much on people's concern with power and resources to the relative exclusion of work on, on how people engage with the process of developing ethical selves. So a good life is not only a materially comfortable life, it's a life that's ethically good. And that's something, again, that we're seeing as emerging very strongly among young people in Bemni at the moment. Now, you might say, well, that's always been the case, surely. Well, actually, in the 20 years that we've been doing this research, and particularly in the years since two, between 2012 and 2020-23, we've seen actually a bit of a shift. So young people in the early 2010s were more focused on the material dimensions of uh, social action, so building infrastructure, uh, obtaining sort of basic needs in those terms. And in the later 2010s and into the early 2020s, there's been this kind of reflection among young people on, on that earlier process of youth mobilization. And part of that reflection has been, well, what we neglected to some extent was actually Puri life, was actually building the social, environmental, spiritual, cultural, or, or reviving and celebrating that, that, that milieu that is part of what makes life worthwhile. And in terms of Sen, I think there is actually a critique of Amartya Sen embedded in the paper, though we haven't brought that out. Um, it would be, I'd be really interested in discussing that with you. I mean, Sen is talking about building capabilities as a way of understanding social development, as you very well know. But what he leaves out is the question of, well, if, if, if you're expanding your own freedoms, but actually you're doing so in a way that is environmentally damaging, how do you assess that? And, and I think what, what's interesting about the material that we're we're working with is actually people are very concerned with with sort of sense of capabilities, but they're also con concerned with thinking about what is the precipitate of us all performing and working towards those capabilities in terms of the capacity of a, a meaningful region, the high Himalayas, to, to sustain itself environmentally, socially and culturally, spiritually. And, and I think that's actually a richer theorization of life than, than the theorization offered by Amartya Sen in his capabilities theory. In terms of um, some of the language around uh, life, Zindagi is not used as much in, um, in this part of, of India, though, of course, it is used sometimes. Um, we, we tended to hear more around, around jivan and, and around life. I was talking to one of my PhD researchers, one of Jane Lai's PhD researchers, um, actually yesterday, and he, he was talking about how he, he, in the Western UP context, had heard people actually saying very similar things about, you know, I, I can live, I can jivan, I can live, and I think it is used a little bit more broadly than livelihood, but, but my life is cut. And so we're hearing in other parts of India this same kind of way in which the, the sort of pressures that you and colleagues Alpa, have, have um, described so well, and, and which we've learned from you, actually leading to this very explicit reflection on different types of life and how it is to manage different types of life. Um, the, the place in which we're working is not, a, as, as you pointed out, a, a very good um, situation in which to understand how um, forms of caste oppression are implicated in the way in which people struggle for survival and um, build efforts to, to, to celebrate Puri life. In fact, actually, the process particularly of engaging with Puri life, uh, well, actually, both processes uh, have been associated with forms of um, joint working across caste boundaries. And, and the, the distinctions between Dalits and Rajputs are, are not nearly as marked as they, as they have as, as they were as they are, for example, in the context of Western UP, where I've written about caste, uh, class, and gender. So, um, 
but I, th but I think the framework of, of thinking about the relationship between Jeevan and Puri life and, and critically appraising capabilities in terms of what is the what is the aggregate fallout of of lots of different sections of society pursuing basic life would actually lend itself to um, thinking about social inequalities such as caste. So, um, yeah, that's the beginning of an answer to your, to your really interesting questions. Okay. Jane, uh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry to cut you, Craig. Uh, can I now uh, shift the focus to the room questions? Um, yes, please. Yes. Uh, just introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. My name is Devakar. I'm a PhD researcher here uh, at LSE. Um, I spent eight years of my life in the region that you're researching. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a privilege to see this kind of research come out. And I would hate to be sort of treading on pedantic terms, but you know, the, the terms around Jivan, Gina, uh, you know, they, they, we have to be splitting hairs here because if you touch a elderly person's feet in the region, they wish you jite raho, which is continue to live, right? Uh, which is connected to jivan and jina. Uh, and it can't be associated with stay alive. Right, because if you're wishing someone, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're giving them some wishes, you would want them to prosper, which is connected to the word jivan or jite raho. And I wondered if you had thought about that. Additionally, I was thinking that uh, you know, uh, sort of connecting it to capabilities approach and the thinking around it. Uh, this is a peculiarly difficult place to live, right? Uh, the the place where the rescue was carried out wasn't that far away from. Uh, where the research is being conducted, but there aren't that many people living there. So, so on, on small sort of distances, life becomes incredibly difficult. And hence, re human relationships or reliability in, uh, in, on each other here is humongous, even if you're not connected very strongly. However, the same set of people, when they migrate to Delhi, would they carry out similar values with them and live similar lives? in those spaces. And if they don't, then, then you know, the value of uh, the, the study of life in these varied dimensions, does it carry forward? Or is it limited to these exceptionally difficult circumstances and situations where the fullness of life can be measured in the terms that you're talking about, and then leaving it to ascend when it comes to the plans? Go ahead, Craig. Well, Jane, do you want to answer either of those questions? Yeah, I might actually just start with the second one. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting um, idea to think about, you know, whether people bring those values with them if they migrate out. And I think, I, th I think having spoken to lots of particularly young men who move between the city and and the village, um, or may have spent several years in cities and, and return. Um, the answer is kind of yes and no. So um, I think a lot of this kind of self-consciousness that we're talking about in terms of you know, the difference between Jeevan and Puri life is actually um, uh, kind of made more acute for those people who have moved out and then moved back in. And it's often that kind of realization of being in a city or outside of the village that makes one kind of reflect more acutely on um, the ways in which life is is perceived um, in the region, and so, I, and and also kind of what it means to be of of the region, um, what it means to have kind of grown up there, and um, uh, and I think those, those kind of values really come through in that in, certainly in the in the the story about um, Roshni and and you know her moves between the city and and the village in terms of seeking healthcare. Um, so 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 in some way, actually moving out kind of makes some of those. Um, those conceptions of, of life even more acute. Um, and, and that's partly because they, you know, they, they might see a, the city as somewhere where, where there isn't that kind of collaboration and help um, and you know, much more individualized, much more uh, sort of selfish as it were. 
Um, but there's all sorts of examples, I think, that um, that show that actually those those kind of ways in which people help each other that are not necessarily kin based also pervade in the cities. Um, so, I mean, lots and lots of kin based um, help, but also uh, just during COVID, for example, I know that there was a, you know, a Gawali group that um, uh, just basically pulled all their money um, during the during the COVID lockdowns, pulled all their money and just made sure that anyone who needed anything, any food or um, uh, medications, um, basically could dip into this pooled, um, uh, you know, set of resources. Um, and that lasted for, um, you know, not just the, the lockdown periods, but, but long after that as well. And I think that was some kind of people, you know, actively reflected on that as a, as a way of thinking about the ways in which the way the way that in, in which people think about life in in the region in in the hills actually carries you know it moves with them um, and these were Gawali people not necessarily from Chamoli or even from from the from the block but you know really from uh, uh, you know from throughout those districts so so that's a bit of a kind of yes and a no <laughs> to that question thank you Jane that Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is uh, by Eleanor. Uh, Eleanor, please do introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you very much, Jane and, and Craig, for the talk. Um, my name is Eleanor Power. I'm a, a faculty in the Department of Methodology here at, at LSE and an anthropologist working in, in South India. Um, so I think you gave some really lovely visualizations of people sort of aspiring to and really not just voicing, but enacting uh, Puri life. Um, and I guess what I, what I was thinking is um, uh, to bring in a different idea here, sort of the capacity to aspire uh, of, of, of other. I was wondering, you know, if there are cases where we don't necessarily have this happy uh, fulfillment and an enactment of Puri life. You know, it's it's impressive even that in the story that you got for Roshini, you know, she then did conceive, right? Um, so I'm wondering if you have. Um, cases where that aspiration wasn't really achieved, where people aren't as able to voice or enact those aspirations to the Puri life and maybe how that might align with points on inequality. Uh, if we don't necessarily see that everyone can really make those claims to the that that larger life, uh, the community aspirations and, and all that might come with it, um, ethnographically or otherwise, if, that, if that's something that some people are simply not able to voice and act. Uh, and evoke. Thanks. Jane, do you want to answer that question? I'm sorry, we've just got two minutes left. So Jane, sorry. answer fast because then there's one yeah. more question from the room. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, thank you, Eleanor. Um, um, it, it, we're often um, told that our work is uh, overly optimistic. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that pervades some of our work on, on prefigurative politics as well. Um, look, there are plenty of people who, um, who struggle um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 I and I think part of the question is actually about um, what time scale you think about in these stories. So if I had told you Roshni's story in 2003 or four or nine, then it would have been an absolutely hopeless story or even up to 2014. And I think part of the, the power of doing kind of long-term research is actually that you that you see some of these stories often get worse um, and people's situations get worse, and um, but often kind of, you know, resolve in all sorts of um, interesting ways. Um, so I suppose that's part of, um, part of what we were doing here is also thinking about where do you start and finish a story? Um, and, you know, what, what can you tell from that? Um, but yes, certainly there, um, I mean, even if you just take the Jeevan that, you know, if we take a kind of more, uh, you know, bare life or, or you know, livelihood approach, then um, uh, there are certainly people who, um, uh, you know, who don't have access to resources to, um, or, or, you know, smaller land holdings, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, restricted um, access to labour. Um, you know, a, a, death, a death in the family. Um, you know, again, we can. I could. I could tell you a whole bunch of stories about actually how 
how entire households or entire families have fallen apart, um, you know, often through one person getting sick, uh, which kind of actually then leads to a sort of series of, um, uh, of you know, a, a household falling apart. But, but I don't think that actually negates what we're saying about life <laughs> and, and poorly life. Um, so we might have told quite hopeful stories, but I don't. But but I think we could still tell the same the same stories around around whole life and bare life, actually through a less hopeful story. But I'm aware that I haven't I haven't got any more minutes to talk. <laughs> Sorry, Jane. And there's one last question here from the room. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. My name is Jacob. Thank you for <clears throat> the presentation and also the, the discussion. I, uh, very just comments because you probably won't have time to to answer the first one just Craig, because you mentioned that you were probably trying to do a little bit of a critique of the capability approach in Senia. it's just uh, that i thought you might want to take a look at uh, the uh, i think 2000 or so paper by sudir Arant and amatya sen on sustainable human development where they tried to do exactly what you i think also were suggesting extending uh the capabilities approach in that framework to questions of um, environmental sustainability. And then there's this association, the Human Development and Capabilities Association of many colleagues uh, are trying to do exactly what, what you are, I think, saying you're missing in the original proposal of, of the approach. So it might just be worth looking at that literature and, and to see if there's anything interesting you find there. Um, the second, uh, I think I, I, I think I understand uh, the literature that you're trying to engage with in terms of um, framing this um, around around bare life and all that. I just uh, am not quite sure that uh, that's a fair thing to do in terms of what the concept means and where it comes from. Uh, if you look at the, um, I mean, as you as you both surely know, um, the idea is one that's been proposed in the context of uh, totalitarian institutions, which take the apex in you know, the German concentration camps in, in, in Germany and Poland. Um, and I think what you're describing here, the context you're looking at is one probably more of neglect than a uh, totalitarian uh, regime. And so uh, I'm just not entirely clear on why that would be um, the framework within which you would be looking at these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, just as two comments uh, and thank you. Thanks. Thank, thanks, I'll look at those, at those references, but... Um... I mean, Agam Bem is quite clear that Western liberal democracies are also producing bare life in, in my reading of his work. So he's applying the idea to how Western liberal democracies work. And indeed, Akil Gupta has argued that the Indian state is producing bare life. So I think that's partly what, you know, what, what why we're we're pushing back, but this is also connected to to debates in human geography. So relatively sort of disciplinary specific um, debates around the ahistoricism and um, occlusion of agency in Agamben's work. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to say that that's for today. The, that's all I can take today. But um, it is a very complex ethnography, which uh, you told really well, both of you, and I really wish you the best with this. I, I'd love to see the outcome. Uh, so I am going to wish you both very well, and I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Jane and um, Craig, and hopefully see you next time here in the UK. Okay, then. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.